Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, let your love divine flow down on me. Let your love divine spring up in me. Let your love divine enfold me. Let your love divine flow through me. Amen. Let me begin by asking you, are you a hopeful person? Am I a hopeful person? Could a person detect this from my facial expression, from my posture, from my gait, the way I walk? If they got to talk to me, to talk with me, would they discover from what I say, from the words I use and the way I say what I say, that I'm a hopeful person? If a person shared with me their struggles or sorrows, their confusion or weariness or anger, would they receive from me deep acceptance and listening and then Would they receive words of hope, compassionate, insightful, invigorating, refreshing? Am I truly hopeful? Or am I just an optimist? Am I just a sort of sunny, sunny tempered person, a, a, a glass half full person? Am I just a fortunate person who has escaped the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? Am I a sort of Teflon person? All the troubles of life just slide off me? When, when, we, when, when we are young, we're often full of confidence, full of the zest for life and its challenges. Ain't no sea we can't cross, ain't no mountain we can't tunnel through. We think we will be able to dance and jump and avoid every stone in the avalanche of life's disappointments. But they come. As we get older, that's why it doesn't necessarily become any easier to keep trusting. You know, there are reasons for doubting, reasons for being discouraged. There are perplexities and unanswered questions and disappointed hopes. And sometimes these things happen, things happen which are very shocking, very sudden, very overwhelming. A spouse dies. We or someone we love has a dreadful accident. A brain tumor is discovered. A grandmother is hit by a train on a railway crossing. A man is hacked to death with a meat cleaver in the street. But sometimes these disappointments are drawn out and they are very long, like a gray cloud over our whole lives, which never seems to disperse. An unhappy marriage, or grief over one of our children who is not happy, Constant struggle to make ends meet. Betrayal by a friend who is still unrepentant. A feeling that we have made a mess of our lives, that we have missed opportunities, and sometimes as we get older, we just get tired. Well, the letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome, he wrote to ordinary Christians like you and me. You can read through the whole letter out loud in about 90 minutes. Not many people have actually done it, but you can. And I would like to focus for a few minutes on one passage that we read just now. It's the passage in Romans chapter 5. And in this passage, don't worry, I'm not going to read the whole of Romans out loud. <clears throat> In this passage, Paul has both a theological and a pastoral purpose. 
His theological purpose is to draw out the consequences of justification and firmly to ground Christian assurance and hopefulness in the whole plan of God. But he has a pastoral purpose, and his pastoral purpose is that the Christians in Rome and in Penzance in the year 2016 should not be disappointed. I suppose that hundreds and maybe thousands of pages have been written in commentaries on Paul's letter to the Romans. I keep on reminding myself that the people who first read or first heard, because I dare dare say not many of them could read, the people who first sat in Rome listening to this letter from Paul being read, whom they had never met, They expected to understand. They didn't need a thousand pages of commentary to understand. So Paul begins Romans 5 by saying, Therefore, since we, have just, we are justified by faith. So somebody once said, Whenever we see the word therefore, we should ask what it's there for. So what does it mean to be justified by faith? Well, Paul has quite explained this in chapters 1 to 4. So if you have any questions about justification by faith, please read for chapters 1 to 4 when you get home tonight. In, in much of the world, for much of history, justice has been hard to find. It is not right for a magistrate or a judge to acquit the guilty for a bribe and deny justice to the innocent. You know, one of the first phrases a child learns to say is, it's not fair! It's not fair! Where did they get that idea of fairness? So how on earth could God, the perfectly righteous judge, justify the ungodly, as it says in Romans 4 verse 5? How could the righteous one declare the unrighteous righteous? And the answer is, Very short or very long, according to how much time you've got. But Paul teaches that the source of our justification is God's utterly undeserved love and favour, which is what we call his grace. And he teaches that the ground of our justification is Christ's blood, which, which it says in verse 9, we are justified by his blood, which means that God himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, has borne the penalty of our law-breaking. And this is what we remember and especially celebrate this week in many churches. And this is why we call Friday Good Friday, the best Friday in history, because this is where our debts were paid. This is where our, the penalty of our law-breaking was taken by somebody else. And the means of our justification is faith, that we trustingly open our empty hands to receive from God this gift of justification or (coughs) reconciliation. It's a gift. And the result of our justification is that we are joined to Jesus forever to live a life of gratitude and service. Well, that's it in four sentences. So let me begin by asking you, Do you know that you have been justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ because of what he has done for you? Some of you are saying yes. Some of you are saying yes out loud. Some of you are saying yes in your heads. But there might be some people here this evening who are not sure of their answer to that question. I hope you will be sure by the time this evening ends. And then in the verses which follow... Paul mentions five blessings or five treasures which follow our justification. He says, in the light of all that I have written so far, if we have been put right with God through Jesus Christ as Abraham was, what blessings follow? And the first is peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is shalom, or well-being. This is the peace that passes all understanding. This does not mean we are whistling in the dark to keep our spirits up. 
It means a bottomless peace, a peace that we cannot get to the end of, and because we have it, we can share it. Of course, on the surface, there may be storms and turbulence, but underneath the strong tide of Christ's peace is carrying us along. Do I know this peace? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the second blessing is access to God at all times. Paul says, also through Jesus, we have the privilege of being introduced into the presence of God himself and being made the objects of his special favor an access and a status in which we may and must abide. In other words, we're not meant to come and go. We are meant to stay in touch. Just as a pilot must stay in touch with air traffic control, or just as a soldier needs to stay in touch with his commanding officer, he needs to stay in that access. You know that the geography and architecture of the Jewish faith spoke of limited access. If a person wanted to come close to God, there were ten circles of holiness. First he had to come to the land of Israel, then to the city of Jerusalem, then to the Temple Mount, and then the first part of the temple he would enter would be the court of the Gentiles. On the inner edge of the court of the Gentiles, there was a wall on which was, a posted, on which was posted a warning that anyone who was not a Jew should not proceed any further on pain of death. Next, there was the court of the women. Sorry to, sorry to mention this, but uh, that was the next. And after that, and what I mean is that they weren't, weren't, didn't get any further. Because next was the court of Israelite males, and next was the court of the priests and Levites, and then there was the pavement, and then there was the holy place, and finally behind a thick curtain, the holy of holies, the holiest place. You know, don't you, that it was not God who was protected by these serried ranks of shielding, This was to teach the Jewish people that God was not to be trifled with. He was not an idol. He was holy. Limited access. So many barriers. So many boundaries. Limited access. But we read in the Gospels that when Jesus was crucified, that curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. Not the usual way you tear a curtain. And the mercy seat was exposed and revealed and uplifted. And that means that we can have access to God, to his healing, to his forgiveness, to his presence, always, forever, everywhere. We may find help in a church building or in the church service or in a thin place or in the help of a minister or a counselor or an other Christian friend or in a book. But beyond all this, we have the privilege at all times of direct access to God himself through Jesus. Is this not a treasure? The third blessing is hope. Paul says we exult in our hope that we will share God's glory. We look back to our justification in the past. We enjoy access to God now in the present. And for the future, we exult in anticipation of sharing the wonder and the beauty and the glory of God's indescribable presence. Sometimes we may be all too aware of our own failing health and strength, We cannot do all the things that we could do in the past. We even have trouble doing up our shoelaces. We worry about the way our society is going, the way Europe and the world is going. Diabolical things are happening in the world that the television brings into our front room. 
The news is almost always bad, and we have our own struggles too. But Paul says every day, every step that we take, we take, we are getting one step nearer home. I read of an elderly Christian who was so excited at the prospect of meeting Jesus, he lived for an extra six months. <laughs> At the end of the 3rd century, Athanasius, who was a bishop in Egypt, used this as one of the proof, proofs of the truth of Christ's resurrection. He, he wrote this, Christians, even children, go gaily and mockingly to martyrdom. He said, inflammable stubble naturally fears the menace of fire, but if it is impregnated with asbestos, it is safe. Even so, our Lord has saturated death with life. Through death, deathlessness has been made known to us. He wrote, if we find children playing with a snake, we can be sure that it is dead. If they are making fun of a lion, you can be sure it is either dead or completely bereft of strength. Even so, death is like a dead snake or a dead lion for us. In April 1975 in Cambodia, as the Khmer Rouge were pouring into Phnom Penh to begin four years of gen genocide in which 20% of the country's population died, Major Tang Chirk, a Christian in the Cambodian army, said goodbye to our, our friend and colleague, whose name was Don Cormac, with these words, Brothers and sisters, we are on the victory side. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He was never seen again. The fourth blessing is growing through troubles. Paul says, we exult in our tribulations, our sufferings, the pressures and the trials of life. How come? Because we are absolutely sure that when trials are met with patient faith, endurance is forged, and as faith endures, it is refined and proved like a precious metal, and as faith thus stands the test, my hope of God's glory is strengthened and confirmed. It sounds a bit like the word that we had just now. The picture that comes to my mind is a pottery or a cabinet maker's workshop. All that pounding and molding and sawing and sanding and shaving, how the clay suffers, how the wood suffers. But there is a purpose. On Thursday night, you may have watched a BBC broadcast called The Hell of a Walk. What made Joe Brand, a 58-year-old unfit woman, walk 135 miles across England in seven days? There was pain. But there was a purpose. She was raising money for sport relief. When I looked, she'd raised 850000 Choosing my words carefully, I say Christians are not Stoics. Life hurts at times, sometimes terribly. We do not just say stuff happens. We believe that God, our loving Father, has a purpose for us. And all the time, in every way, he is shaping us for a wonderful future. We may not understand exactly how this works, either now or later. I do not understand the New Testament to promise that God will always explain to us what he is doing. So how do we know that this is true? How do we know that this hope is not illusory, a mirage? Does it disappoint us in the end? How do we not know that we are not just as I said, whistling in the dark to keep our spirits up.
I was in the Edge of the World bookshop not long ago in Market Jew Street looking at a new combined edition of Philip Pullman's famous trilogy, His Dark Materials. You'll know perhaps that Philip Pullman is a very convinced atheist. And the introduction noted that in this, in this series of three books, the children come to the conclusion, we have to build the Republic of Heaven where we are, because for us there is no elsewhere. How do we know that there is an elsewhere? And the, this is the fifth blessing. Because the fifth blessing is that God's love is the proof of the security of our hope. Because Paul says that that love with unstinting lavishness has been poured into our innermost being by the Holy Spirit which has been poured into our hearts. This is the Pentecostal gift. Through this gift, the lives of individuals and whole communities can be changed, the testimony to which can be seen in every town and village of Cornwall. In the 18th century, the motto of the Church of England, summarized in one edition of The Spectator, was moderation leading the hand of religion. Church of England writers at that time believed that this was the middle way between bigotry and atheism. And into this desert of mediocrity and superstition and absenteeism and complacency, the Methodist revival was a major outpouring of the love of God. If you're a Methodist, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not many Methodists here. <laughs> love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. When shall I find my longing heart all taken up by thee? Made perfect first in love and sanctified by grace, we shall from earth remove and see his glorious face. Out and out the hymns poured. They sang, they sang and sang and sang. And the flame of this love was carried all over Cornwall, as we can see and hear today. We do not have to listen very hard to hear the echoes of this, but they are growing fainter. But lovers become like the person they love and Christians become like Jesus because they love him. You know, on the whole, the children of the 90s and the noughties and the teenies are switched off from the church, as we can see here tonight. But Jesus still fascinates people. He is what the world needs, and this is what they and we are looking for. These are the five blessings, the five treasures of the gospel. These are the five small stones which will kill the Goliaths of disappointment who mock our trust in the living God. Peace with God, access to God at all times and places, the hope of glory, growing through troubles, and a heart overflowing with the love of God. So let me conclude. Someone is sitting here thinking, you haven't had to go through what I had to go through, or what I am going through right now. And this may be quite correct. But I'm not offering you my expert advice based on my personal assessment of your situation. I'm just explaining what the good news is, what the gospel is. These promises are for each and every one of us. These promises that I've just been trying to explain briefly are not just for some elite. Secondly, somebody is thinking, I, w- I wish I had your faith. But we are not in a competition. 
You do not know my struggles and I do not know yours. Here is a poster. by a Roman, German Roman Catholic painter, Sigurd Kurder. I'm sure you all know the story. It's the story of uh, Jesus rescuing <coughs> Peter as he began to sink in the stormy sea. There are at least five hands in this picture, but the, the ones that are most prominent are the three at the front. Two hands stretched up and one hand stretched down. From the hands stretched up, you can see how tightly Peter is holding on to the hand that is stretched down. We are not saved by the love we exercise, but by the love we trust. Would be one of the ways I explain the meaning of this picture. Or to put it another way, the strength of faith lies not in the one trusting, but in the one trusting. In the hand stretched down, not those hands stretched up. So that's what I would say in response to the person who says, I wish I had your faith. Thirdly, somebody is thinking or feeling, I do not experience this overflowing love of God in my heart. To which I say, Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Ask on your own account or ask someone to pray with you or for you. You know, sometimes God chooses to pour his love into our hearts through a friend who acts as a conduit. I hope that we have all had that experience to some extent. Or, fourthly, somebody may be thinking, well, I don't know where to start. I don't even know if I'm on this journey. Well, there are pastors and teachers and friends and guides here. We will pray, to, pray with you tonight. We'll pray for you tonight. I've also bought some booklets. I think some of you may have seen some already. There's one here called Might There Be More to Easter? There's one called Knowing God Personally. There's one called Why Jesus. There's one called Jesus an Introduction. There's one called Is There a God? Very short. (laughs) And there's one called Who Am I? They're on the table just in the, in the, um, what do you call it? The what? Foyer, foyer. I, I, I'm not posh. I don't, I don't know these words. It's, it's, I, I'm sure some of you remember, I was going to call it a narthex, but that doesn't sound very Methodist. You know, I remember a song that came, came back to me as I was thinking about this very sentence. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open and you may go in. At Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. I must have learned that song 60 years ago or more. That's that's the truth. That's where you begin. So uh, we're going to finish with some songs. Um, And the last one we're going to sing is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. And as we sing the last song, we're going to sing it prayerfully and joyfully at the same time, asking that God may make all of us and each of us channels of his love throughout this town. Because this love, this, these five treasures of the gospel were not given to us to hoard, but to share. So let's um, sing together. Ed has prepared some further songs for us. And as we sing, uh, you can think, what response, how do I want to respond to what I have heard this evening? What, do I need to make a decision? Do I need to make a, a vow, a promise? Do I need, just need to open my heart? Do I need to ask for prayer? 
Do I need to take for a, a booklet? Or do I just, just need to sit there or stand there with an open heart and open hands to ask for God to refresh me again with these wonders that have been put before us?